please welcome project managers at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, Dr. Brock Wester and Dr. Kapil Katyal. Hello, I'm Brock Wester, and this is Kapil Katyal, and we're from the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. And we've been working with DARPA for about a decade in the field of brain-computer interfaces on a program called Revolutionizing Prosthetics. We've been exploring how we can take signals from the brain and find patterns in those signals and use those to drive prosthetic systems. So we're focused on prosthetics, but others in the field of BCI have explored similar methods to those on the program to connect brains to communication devices, to mobility platforms, and even vehicles. And the field of BCI has been an early adopter of machine learning methods. Given that uh, no two brains are alike and no one brain is going to operate the same day to day, the field needed adaptive methods, machine learning methods that can make sense of what the brain is saying and discriminate certain kinds of neural or brain activity uh, over others. So the field of BCI is very multidisciplinary. As a colleague once said, it takes a village to connect a brain to a computer. Uh, and given uh, BCI systems requirements for a neural interface, for uh, signal processing and machine learning, software and systems engineering, and understanding of the brain, and for our field, mechanical and electrical engineering, the people that make up the teams that drive innovation and exploration in this space are going to come from a variety of different backgrounds. And that's why there are two of us here talking with you today. Uh, my research is in neuroscience and neuroengineering, and Kapil's research is in robotics and machine learning. Now, I mentioned that uh, machine learning was an early adopter. I'm oh, sorry, uh, BCI was an early adopter of machine learning. Uh, we've been using this practice for decades. And we anticipate that as more and more systems and technologies and applications fold in machine learning and AI, that this multidisciplinary trend will continue. So at its core, a BCI system is a machine learning system. It takes signals from a sensor and it finds patterns in those signals. And because these signals have to be processed in real time, it requires thoughtful systems design and the use of the right algorithms. So this diagram uh, exemplifies a typical BCI system, and it starts with a neural interface. And the, the field uses a variety of neural interfaces, uh, some of those you see on the left. Some of these are invasive. They'll actually project into the brain tissue to specific recording targets, uh, such as intracortical electrode arrays. Some of them will sit on top of the brain and record activity from a large population of neurons, such as the electrocorticography or, or ECOG arrays. And some will sit on the scalp. They're non-invasive, and they'll collect information from, from the entire brain uh, cortex. And each of these neural interfaces is going to collect this noisy, stochastic neural activity. It's going to, as you can see in the green block, it will filter and amplify that activity. And in the blue block, it will search for patterns, extract relevant features, and apply a variety of machine learning approaches to translate those data in some useful uh, signal to drive a device or a system. Now, there have been a variety of machine learning methods uh, applied uh, in the field, some of them discriminant, some of them generative, uh, such as linear discrete analysis, support vector machines, deep neural nets, Kalman filters, Wiener kernels, and now uh, reinforcement learning. Um, but the signal processing approach is going to be driven typically by the neural interface. Each one is going to acquire a different looking signal, and each one is going to be useful in different ways. And DARPA programming has uh, explored uh, each of these neural interfaces in different ways. So to help illustrate how BCI has uh, utilized and driven machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, we're going to describe a variety of systems and fit them into uh, three paradigms. Uh, the first paradigm is a typical traditional BCI system that uses machine learning for neural decoding of specific direct functions. And the second paradigm is connecting BCI systems to intelligent systems that have some measure of autonomy that can take simple, easily trained BCI signals and use those to direct an intelligent system through some complex task. And in the third paradigm, we talk about the fusion of AI and BCI into uh, more of a learning framework that can better generalize. And such a system that knows how to control one object will know how to interact with uh, a similar object, a different object. Uh, so we'll step through each of these uh, paradigms. We'll start with the first. Um, DARPA has been investing and advancing BCI capabilities since the 1970s, starting with its bio-cybernetics program. 
Uh, and this and other early DARPA programs have focused on unlocking the potential of BCI to control devices, encode memories, uh, understand visual signal processing, and have developed some of the foundational capabilities that enables research for today in this space. Um, this has included the Revolutionizing Prosthetics Program, which was initiated in 2006 with the goal of rapidly advancing the current state of prosthetic systems and developing new means for people to drive them. One of the goals on this program was to develop this modular prosthetic limb system. Uh, this has the speed, strength, range of motion, form factor, and weight of the 50 percentile military man. And it also has sensors in the fingertips that can uh, detect forces and accelerations. But as a research platform, has enabled a variety of BCI studies in motor control and brain sensory simulation. And through work with some amazing people, we have been successful in using BCI signals to drive these prosthetic systems in different ways. So this is Jan. Uh, we worked with her on the prosthetics program with the University of Pittsburgh, and she volunteered to have two intracortical electrode arrays placed in her motor cortex. And through months of training, she was able to control the modular prosthetic limb in three directional dimensions, three uh, rotational dimensions, and open and close her hand in various ways. And using these, she was able to feed herself a bar of chocolate, as you saw in the video, which for her was a major reason for joining the study. It's a, it's a good reason. Um, and this is Nathan here on the right. And uh, he has the same kinds of arrays that Jan does, um, but in addition to the motor cortex, he also has arrays placed in the somatosensory cortex. And this is the area of the brain that processes a sense of touch. So he can direct the limb in the same way that Jan can, uh, but when he reaches out and make, makes contact with objects on his fingertips, uh, he can sense those forces. Um, so when he reaches out and shakes Obama's hand, he can uh, feel that handshake. So these two have been able to accomplish amazing things on the program, and at least in the field, they're uh, pretty much heroes. Uh, one of the uh, amazing things of the brain is its ability to generalize. Uh, once we learn how to press a button or to turn or rotate a knob, uh, we can apply that learned skill to a variety of different objects in a variety of different scenarios. And I happen to get a front row seat to this myself. Uh, I have a one-year-old who's getting really good at reaching out and grabbing objects and manipulating objects. He's also getting really good at opening cabinets and drawers and other things, which is a bit stressful, um, but amazing to see. And we explored uh, this, this similar uh, ability with Jan and Nathan after they learned how to control the modular prosthetic limb. So we use the same neural mappings that were tied to directional and rotational control, and we connected them to the surface features of an aircraft within a flight simulator. And within minutes, both Nathan and Jan were able to fly through hoops and through the Grand Canyon and over and around the, the pyramids of uh, Egypt in the flight simulator. Um, and as you can see on this video on the right, Nathan was able to uh, not only direct a plane here at the center of the screen, but he was also able to control the behavior of these aircraft here at the top of the screen at the same time. So what we see here in this uh, first paradigm is the ability to use BCI signals uh, for low-level direct control of specific functions, uh, such as controlling a prosthetic limb or controlling a plane. And for some use cases, this is going to be the best uh, approach for users to interact with objects or to interact with the world. Um, there are some limitations associated with this control uh, related to the user's attention and the amount of information that we can collect from the neural interface, the signal bandwidth. Um, and while this is the, the best approach for some methods, it's going to require a lot of training. So it's still an active area of research, but this led us to our second paradigm, which we began exploring in parallel. And that is the use of simple, easily trained BCI commands to direct an intelligence system through a complex task uh, semi-autonomously. So these intelligence systems use a variety of uh, support technologies, uh, such as eye tracking, which can give us better uh, insight into the user's intent, and computer vision, which can scan the workspace around the user and identify objects, figure out how to manipulate those objects, suppose what the user might want to do with them, uh, generate a list of tasks that can be completed, present that to the user for them to select. So in this kind of system, the actual intent signals from the user could be something as simple as uh, a go switch uh, or maybe a gas pedal that can initiate or advance the intelligence system through the selected task. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of information from the brain, and it doesn't require a lot of training. And in some cases, it doesn't even necessarily need to be in real time. So instead of Jan 
uh, directing the limb to a bar of chocolate on the table and closing the fingers around that chocolate bar and bringing it to her face carefully for her to take a bite. She can simply look at that chocolate bar and think, uh, I want to eat it, send a go signal to the system for it to carry out that task. Uh, the system knows where the chocolate bar is on the table, knows how to grab it, and with uh, eye tracker and a simple BCI, it can carry out that task um, pretty easily. So we explored this concept in an early prototype. And here you see we have a computer vision sensor that's uh, scanning the workspace around the modular prosthetic limb and providing a video feed to the user. And on top of this video feed, we had some augmented reality overlays uh, that showed the user where it identified objects on this table, in this case, balls. And when the user looked at the objects and sent a go signal with their brain computer interface, the system would then initiate this, this task, which is picking up the ball, um, and complete it without them having to think about the low-level controls associated with manipulating the limb. Now, one thing you'll notice is that this user is moving their arm. This is not a paralyzed individual, but they do have a direct neural interface, an electrocorticography grid, uh, which is providing us a BCI signal associated and correlated with arm movements. Now, this is a very simple BCI signal, so this doesn't require uh, an invasive interface. In some cases, it can require a non-invasive interface, or if the interface, uh, the control system is simple enough, it can be done with just an eye tracker or a gaze tracker, which we explored in this system here. So this is Glenn. Glenn has a robotic manipulator mounted to his wheelchair, and he's able to control that manipula manipulator using buttons and menus that are presented in his mixed reality headset. He also has a computer vision sensor over his shoulder that's scanning the workspace and identifying objects, in this case, uh, a coffee maker. And when it identifies that coffee maker, it will uh, present a context menu that he can navigate using the system and then select a particular task to be completed. So this kind of interface provides uh, a close coupling with the user. Uh, user and the interface is, is connected uh, pretty closely. Uh, provides an opportunity to provide a lot of useful visual content, including the uh, limb overlay that you see there as well, um, which could be useful for example, displaying what the task, how the task will be executed in advance of it actually being executed. So what we see here for this second paradigm is uh, a very simple interface driving an intelligent system, and we've been successful in demonstrating a number of different uh, applications and useful uh, uses of such a system. Um, but it is dependent greatly on the capabilities of the intelligent system, uh, namely the computer vision and the manipulation. So there's a lot of ways that this system can fall down. But uh, similar to the first paradigm, our team is still exploring second paradigm approaches. But we have started another paradigm, a new paradigm, uh, which Kapil will talk to you about right now. Thank you, Brock. So the last few years have been great. Uh, we've made tremendous progress in combining direct neural interfaces with technologies such as eye tracking, computer vision, perception, autonomy, et cetera. But the reality is there's still a long road ahead, and we need to uh, understand exactly how we can uh, really take the things that we've learned from uh, from tasks that we've performed and extend it to things beyond the lab. And then the second thing that we're working on is also how do we take information uh, that's basically developed by the brain, uh, uh, brain computer interface and fuse that with information from an artificial intelligence. And so on this slide here, if we think about um, the video with Glenn, uh, we think about how he was able to make coffee. Uh, the reality is, you know, when you're teaching somebody how to make a cup of coffee, there's a lot of things that you're teaching along the way. You're not just showing somebody how to make a cup of coffee, you're learning primitives such as how do I reach for a target object, how do I grasp something, how do I lift up a handle, how do I press a button. And the reality is that, is that if you can reason about these primitives in a way that makes sense from, uh, from being able to recombine them in, in, in new uh, uh, novel scenarios, you effectively enable us to take those primitives and recombine them and, and perform tasks that, that are much different than the initial demonstration. And so that's one of the research areas that we're working on right now. Um, so here is a, a video of a robot manipulator basically reaching down and, and lifting an object. So you can play the video. And what we want to show here is that instead of just teaching the robot arm how to reach and, and lift an object, we want to really learn the primitives associated with that task. In this case, uh, if you look on the chart on the, on, the, uh, on the right, it's the reach, grasp, and lift stages. 
And so the way we're able to do this is to apply machine learning techniques such as taking the velocity of, a, uh, of the entire trajectory. And the intuition is that if we can find abrupt changes in that velocity, we can find transition points where we can start thinking about where these different primitives uh, can get chunked together. And then using unsupervised learning techniques, we can actually figure out the exact decomposition. And the idea now is if we can reason about these primitives, the, our research objective now is to show that we can take neural control and we can recombine these primitives into doing something that's completely different than the initial demonstration. The next area that I want to talk about is actually fusing brain-computer interfaces with uh, artificial intelligence. And so what we're doing this uh, is part of a program called Mavericks. So Mavericks is, uh, stands for Multi-Autonomous Vehicle Reasoning Control System. And the objective of this task is, is really an intelligence uh, surveillance and reconnaissance mission in a maritime environment. So you can play the video. And we can see basically it's, uh, the idea is you have a swarm of UAVs. And the idea is you're trying to uh, ensure that you're getting uh, as much visibility of your target agents as much as possible. And you know, the reality is there's a lot of UAV swarm algorithms that exist to date, but it's really hard to alter the behavior of these swarm algorithms in real time. And so what we've done is we've built uh, a you know, AI engine that can basically take environmental sensor data and fuse that with brain-computer information data. And so we're using deep reinforcement learning as the AI agent, and that performs the low-level actions to basically allocate the swarm. And then we're using neural decoders on the brain-computer interface side to provide insight into the system that gives information that requires human intuition, things like, is this uh, entity dangerous? Is this, uh, what's the lethality of the system? Things that require a whole lifetime of experiences to, to understand. Things that an AI system would have a lot of difficulty in understanding. And so by combining these two things, our objective, our research objective is to show that we can make better decisions, a policy that can make better decisions than the BCI or the AI alone. And we're excited that we're able to do this as part of the revolutionizing prosthetics program. So in January, we implanted a, a new patient with three stimulating and three uh, recording electrode arrays. That's 50% more than any other participant that's ever been implanted uh, previously. And throughout the, the next couple of months, uh, we're really excited about showing how we can work with this patient and understand exactly how we can use this vast amount of BCI data to control not only swarms uh, in simulation in the physical world, but other complex systems that extend beyond our imagination. All right, so we will uh, end with this passage. Uh, this is from a book called The Brain Electric, which provides uh, an overview of the activities and the history of the, the program. Um, and uh, one of the takeaways, the underlying narrative for this and for the, the quote, is that we're basically at an inflection point right now uh, with the state of AI and BCI uh, we essentially don't necessarily have to rely on our motor system, our mouths, our muscles to interact with the world. Um, and this opens up a lot of new possibilities for communication, for people to interact with one another, for us to drive machines, and for us to connect with our world in new ways. So, thank you. So um, we got a few questions here. Uh, this work seems mostly about sending output signals from the brain to be used or merged with AI controls. Is there any prospect for receiving information from the AI neurally? Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, neural stimulation and uh, the ability to um, provide feedback to the user in real time. Uh, there, there are other ways to, to fold in the user to these systems uh, using, uh, obviously, visual. Uh, stimuli and uh, neural stimuli. And that's one of the things we're exploring on this program is the close coupling between the individual and the system. Um, this relates a little bit to the, another question. Uh, given the potential invasive aspects of this, interacting with AI and BCI doesn't seem very practical. Is there a prospect for me to use BCI in my lifetime? Um, so for both neural recording and neural simulation, there are a variety of new methods that are being uh, developed that are non-invasive. Uh, in fact, DARPA has some programs in this space uh, that's looking at non-invasive methods. Uh, optical methods are one of them. Uh, using ultrasound is another uh, for us to record from and stimulate in the brain. Um, and this is an active area of research. And the hope is that these technologies will enable more users to, to interact with these kinds of systems. And then a uh, third question that we had was, um, how do we, how, how do the patients uh, feel about the technologies that they're using? 
And I think uh, from a technologist, I think the time that you spend with the patients is actually extremely valuable. Um, you know, you get to directly observe and understand you know, what are the pain points, what are the areas that you can improve. You know, you look at that and you say, well, I think that technology can really uh, make that a lot easier for, for this particular participant. And so for me, it's always been a, a, you know, a rewarding experience to be able to be in that lab and, and uh, try to understand uh, ways that we can innovate and, and make, things, make things a lot easier for, for them to use the systems. We have a little bit more time, so I'll, sh I'll get to this last one here. Uh, once a system is trained for one user, is the system tied to that one user, or can the system be transferred uh, or shared by other users? Um, so this is a good question. Uh, we talked a little bit about no two brains being the same, and day-to-day, the, -day, the, the same brain is gonna behave differently. So that's why machine learning is so important. Um, and there's a, a, you know, there's a training period associated with connecting these devices and these user interfaces to people. Um, and as machine learning improves, as online training improves, uh, the ability for someone uh, to you know, pick up their system and, and interact with it successfully, uh, and for new users to, to use similar technologies is gonna get better and better as we move forward, as machine learning gets better. So, thank you. Thanks.